Our Bible reading today, ladies and gentlemen, is John chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. Please follow along in your service booklets on the screen in front of you or in your Bibles. Therefore they took Jesus away. Carrying his own cross, he went out to what is called Skull Place, which in Hebrews is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign lettered and put on the cross. The inscription was, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Don't write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate replied, What I've written, I've written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but toss for it to see who gets it. They did this to fulfil the scripture that says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on hyssop and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's an outline there in your service sheets or on the screen. Uh, There won't be an opportunity, unfortunately, to ask any questions at the end, but let's spend some time together considering the events we've just read about. Uh, In this current uh, pandemic-derived climate, there's a lot of syllables there, isn't there? Uh, One of the things that stood out for me is the way that so many people are trying new stuff within the constraints placed upon us by government legislation and social distancing. Uh, People are baking bread. Uh, People are trying different types of craft. People are homeschooling or doing education at home. Some people are exercising. People are using technology that they never thought they would, or at least I am. Uh, We're also doing Easter without gathering, which is something remarkably new for the people of God. Uh, I think this is sad. Uh, It's a reminder of God's design for the church to be the physical gathering of his people. But there's also an irony there too. Someone said to me the other day, I'll never miss a church gathering or event ever again. Our separation has actually created a desire for physical gathering. Now, irony is one of those new things that I've been thinking about. Uh, It was raised for me as I read some comments on today's passage earlier on this week. Don Carson, the bloke I was reading, made the comment that the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus were deeply and significantly ironic. Now, I've used that term a number of times in my lives, but I thought I've I've never really spent time looking at the Gospels as ironic. In fact, I can't even remember looking up irony in the dictionary, so I did. Uh, One of the definitions I read said, irony in its broader sense is a rhetorical device, a, a literary technique, an event in which what appears on the surface to be the case differs radically from what is actually the case. And put more simply, words are used to convey the opposite of what is really going on. In this sense, as I spent time in John 19, I was confronted with something new this Easter, and not just no physical gathering. I was confronted with the wonderfully exposing irony of the death of Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you 
for the various things that you've provided us with so that physically separate, we can still spend time in our own households remembering the goodness of this Friday, of the day upon which your son died for our sins so that his mission could be accomplished and we could come to know you and have life. Father, please use the irony that is so clear in these gospel accounts, especially here in John, to expose new things about ourselves and most importantly, our need for what Jesus has done. In his name we pray. Amen. On that point too, on the outline, we're familiar with the bare bones of the events of the end of Jesus' life. Uh, He shared a last Passover meal with his closest friends. Uh, That's a meal that the people of God used every year to remember the way in which God had saved them, saved them out of slavery in Egypt, saved them to become his people, saved them through the substitution of a perfect animal on behalf of them. Uh, Having shared that final time of conversation and prayer with his closest friends, Jesus walks out of Jerusalem to a garden. He's arrested. He's submitted to a trial by the Jewish authorities. He's submitted to a trial by the Roman authorities. And the two trials overlap in terms of their outcome, achieving one outcome, the sentence of death on a perfect man. For the Jews, this is because Jesus claimed to be God. Though the charge they lay before the Roman authorities is that Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews in opposition to Caesar. For the Romans, this achieved a level of political expediency. It quietened down a rabble of potentially rebellious Jews and it achieved a level of political humiliation. It elicited from the Jews a statement that we have no king, no lord but Caesar. And at the point that we pick up our account in John 19 verse 16, our attention is drawn to events that are deeply ironic. Three key events stand out, three moments building on each other, raising our awareness of what's going on here. They're there in your outline. As Jesus is crucified, a sign is fixed to the cross above his head. Look at verse 19 through 22. Pilate also had a sign lettered and put on the cross. The inscription was, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I've written, I've written. From Pilate's side, the sign above Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Well, for Pilate, it's a none too subtle dig at the Jews. He's reasserting who's in real control here. He's making sure that they realize who is the boss. From the Jewish side, it's an offense. After all, Jesus was not their king in any form. He was a pretender, an offensive pretender, and they wanted the wording changed to make this clear. But as people have read John's biography, by this point we've come to know that he's been identified as such as the king of the Jews. Nathaniel, way back in John chapter 2, verse 49, recognized that Jesus was God's promised king. When Jesus entered Jerusalem in John 12, he was welcomed as a king, the king who had been foretold in the Old Testament. And in John 17, verse 2, Jesus himself knew that he'd been granted authority over all things. Pilate saw a moment of political one-upmanship. The Jewish authorities saw a moment for their own self-importance. But Jesus was revealed as God's chosen king by dying on a cross. As Jesus gets close to death, he calls out. A look there in verses 28 to 29. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on hyssop and held it up to his mouth. From the perspective of the soldiers, given the task of crucifying Jesus, this is a sure sign that they've done their job, as they knew they could. This man is dying, and they know it. 
from the perspective of those watching, his mother and close friends standing near the cross, Jesus is obviously out of control. He's the victim here. The object of an unjust arrest, a wrongful conviction and a horrific death. But as people have read John's biography, by this point we're directed to the complete and utter control of Jesus. Did you notice the words that John uses in verse 28? Jesus is so in control that he's making sure that even the prophecies connected with what he'll drink at his last moment are being fulfilled. For example, Psalm 69 verse 21. Moreover, if you step back and look at all of these verses together, you'll notice how carefully structured the events are where things happen because Jesus is in control. Even the moments surrounding the clothing of Jesus here in verse 24 fulfill Psalm 22 verse 18. Even the state of the bones in Jesus' legs, verses 36 to 37, fulfill what was talked about in Psalm 34 verse 20, Zechariah 12 verse 10. All of these events, from the bones in his legs to the clothes on his body to what he drinks at his last moment, all of these events are governed by God's plans foretold. Now the Roman soldiers saw a moment of a job well done. Jesus' family and friends saw a moment of tragedy and mishap. Jesus himself knew that all things were happening as they should. As Jesus dies, he cries out in a loud voice. Verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It's a striking moment across all four biographies of Jesus. Only John records this specific quote. But all the biographies describe Jesus as dying with a loud cry. Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23. Uh, it's striking because crucifixion was death by drowning or strangulation. Neither are conducive to a loud cry. Another moment when Jesus shows his complete mastery of the situation. From the perspective of the Roman soldiers and the Jewish leaders, it's mission accomplished. The man is dead. He's finished. From the perspective of Jesus' family and friends, it's a moment of utter despair. All their dreams, all their hopes are now finished as Jesus breathes his last. But as people who have read the biography of Jesus from John reaching this point, we must be struck by the way Jesus finishes with this one word. It, it is one word, tetelestai. It's a word which has already been used twice in different forms in verse 28. It's a word that Jesus himself has used a number of times to describe what he's doing in John 4.34, 5.36 and 17.4. Each time he carries the meaning and weight of mission accomplished. Jesus has come to do a job. He's single-minded about that job. He's focused on that job, continuing it until it is accomplished. For the Romans and the Jewish leaders, it is finished means that Jesus is finished. He's dead, he's gone, he's defeated. For the friends and family of Jesus, it is finished means that their hopes are dashed. But for Jesus, it is finished means that he has accomplished everything that was set before him. The irony is clear, isn't it? You mustn't miss it. The opposite of what so many think is going on is actually taking place. What seems to be happening is not really what is happening. But, and this this is the key question that this irony poses us, what has Jesus accomplished? Now before we go further, I'm at point three on the outline, before we go further, the irony here is that those who think they've triumphed have just confirmed their rejection of Jesus and God, just as God said they would. Listen, to the prologue, the beginning of John's biography, John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. The prologue to John's biography of Jesus warned that such a day would come. At the moment when the enemies of Jesus think that they have won, all they've done is confirm what God knew would take place. 
But there's more going on here than just confirming the rejection of God and his plans. In the very same prologue that describes the rejection of Jesus, we're shown the plan of God, the mission that Jesus was sent to accomplish. John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. The mission of Jesus is no less than the mission that God gave Adam and Eve, that God gave Abraham and Abraham's family. It's the mission to reveal God to the world. It's not a simple show and tell. The whole purpose behind this revelation of God is so that people come back to God and have life as God designed it. That was what was lost in the judgment of Adam and Eve. That was what God committed to in the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1-3. That's what God's family, Abraham's family, were commanded to do in Exodus 9 and 1 to 8 and completely failed to do. And that's what Jesus has come to do. Jesus himself is very clear about this. Listen to what he says in John chapter 4, verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. Jesus is very clear that he came to reveal God as he truly is, the most significant one in all of the universe. Listen to John 17, verse 4. I have glorified you, God, on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And Jesus is very clear that this is connected to life as God intended. John 17, verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh so he may give eternal life to all you've given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one that you have sent, Jesus Christ. The mission that Jesus was given was the mission to reveal God as he is to the world, so that the world would know him and come to have life as God intended. The problem is this, we are sinners. Humans are indelibly, irreparably of themselves damaged by sin. We are beset, all of us, with the attitude and action that says, why do I need to know God? I'm God and God is not. Our default position is that we don't want to know God. We cannot know God. We refuse to know God because... We're God. We cannot know God because of our sin and the judgment we are under for our sin from God. We do not want to know him. We cannot know him because we are his enemies. We are opposed to him. We are under his judgment for rejecting him. Well, it seems a fairly forlorn proposition, doesn't it, this mission, put like that? Jesus came to reveal God so that we humans could have life. We cannot know God because we are sinners who are under his judgment. How will this be resolved? How will this be resolved? Well, the resolution comes in the irony of the death of Jesus, the one rejected by humans, put to death because he came to reveal God, dies so that we can know God. Let me say that again. The one rejected by humans, put to death because he came to reveal God, dies so that we can know God. That's always been the purpose of Jesus' mission. Right from the very beginning, he was recognized by one of the first witnesses as coming for this job. John the Baptist says in John 1, 29, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In case you missed it, the very next morning in John 1.36, John the Baptist says it again. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God at the heart of Jesus' mission to reveal God as he is was the key issue of dealing with human sin. This mission could only be accomplished by Jesus, the perfect man, dying for all the imperfect humans. 
by him being the perfect substitute for humans in sin. Jesus stood in for us, stood in place of us, taking the judgment for our sin upon himself so that that judgment paid. We could come and know God through Jesus whom he sent. How ironic. The very moment when the Romans and the Jewish authorities thought they'd won. The very moment when those closest to Jesus were crushed. That very moment is the moment when Jesus accomplishes the mission he had. He died as the perfect substitute for our sin, taking the judgment for our sin so that we could know God. How ironic. As people have tried new stuff during this pandemic, I'm at point four on the outline, different parts of their lives and their personalities have been stripped back, changed and revealed. Irony performs the same role. It exposes and reveals as we realise what we thought was happening is actually something much deeper. As we share an Easter unlike any other we've probably experienced, let me encourage you to let the irony of the crucifixion work on you, exposing, revealing and posing questions. Here are three questions to start with. They're there on your outline. Who is Jesus? The irony in Jesus' crucifixion must expose the common views of Jesus, that he was a victim, that he was a good bloke, that he was misguided, that he was a charlatan. They must expose those common views and bring us to the real Jesus and the real mission he came for, that he is the one who came to reveal God as only God could be revealed by his very own son, the one who came to reveal God by dealing with our greatest roadblock, sin, the one who accomplished a mission set before him, not as a victim but as a victor, to bring life by bringing sinners back to God. Who is God? That's the second question. The irony here in Jesus' death must expose our common views of God. That is a judgmental old man. That is a distant and forgetful grandpa. That is an inconsequential divinity. That is just an empty space out there into which we pour our own views. God's none of those. God is the one who wants to be known by us through Jesus alone. God is the one we must know if we're to actually have life as it should be. And who am I? That's the third question. That's the question we must finish on today. This current pandemic, the fascination with trying new stuff to get by has caused many people to ask who they are. For example, people who've never baked a loaf of bread can now make a loaf of bread. But even more importantly, let the irony of the death of Jesus strip back some more layers as you ask yourself, who am I? Am I someone who continues not to know God through Jesus and so not to have life? Do I have life even at a time when everyday life has been turned on its head because I know Jesus and so I know God? Let me pray. Dear Father, thank you for the irony that is here in the crucifixion of Jesus. What so many think is going on is not really what is going on. What is really going on is the finishing, the accomplishment of the job that you set your only son Jesus to come so that we might know you and have life, to come and die for our sins, removing that roadblock to knowing you. Father, we pray that you will use this irony to work on us, to expose who Jesus truly is, who you truly are, and who we truly need to be. People who come to know you through Jesus Christ alone. Amen.